Welcome to this special edition of Couples Therapy in Seven Words. I am your co-host, Judy Alexander, and I'm here with my husband, Dr. Bruce Chalmer. Well, hello, Judy, and hello, viewers and listeners. Yes, this is indeed a special edition. Tell folks the title. It's a rather, rather a longer title than usual, but tell folks the title. Okay, well, Reigniting the Spark, Loving, Sexy, Thriving Relationships in Seven Words. Genesis Amaris Kemp interviews us that's the wrinkle mm -hmm. this instead of our being the interviewers we got to be the interviewees with a delightful woman named genesis amaris kemp uh -huh. and you will get to see the uh, interview shortly right um, and so before we show you that we first want to put in our usual plug to let folks know about the podcast go to our website ctn7.com and uh tell folks and this one, uh, you'll see, it's going to be her interview of us sort of embedded in our podcast today. Um, she she does a lot. This I think we're like interview number 400 and something or 500. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's, she really does. She packs a lot of interviews in, in, in a day. She does. She uh, does. But she was really very engaging. Mm -hmm. It was really, really fun for us. Yeah. So we hope you'll enjoy it. And uh, also, I want to put in a, a plug for a brief plug for the book because I also plugged the book in the uh, interview that she did as well. Right, reigniting the spark: why stable relationships lose intimacy and how to get it back. So please look for that anywhere books are sold. So, without further ado, we will turn you over to our the one who's going to interview us, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. And we'll be back on the other side of it. See you later. Thank you so much for tuning back into another segment here on GEMS Podcast. With me is a double whammy, y'all. So I have Dr. Bruce Chalmer and Judy Alexander. They are a married couple. And let me tell you a little bit more about them. And you already know me, of course, Ms. Genesis Amaris Kent, the founder and host. But it's more about my guest today. So... Um, Dr. Bruce Chalmer and Judy Alexander, as I said, a married couple living in Vermont. Dr. Dr. Bruce has been helping individuals, couples, and families in private practice for over 30 years. His practice is now focused on couples. Bruce's other notable interests include musical composition, performance, and choral directing. Bruce is the author of Reigniting the Spark why stable relationships lose intimacy and how to get it back <laughs> judy recently retired after 23 years as education director at temple sinai a reform jewish congregation in south burlington vermont previously she was a classroom teacher and was also an award-winning advertising copywriter she is also a play she also a playwright with several of her plays having been produced at theater festivals judy and bruce have five adult children and delightfully increasing collection of grandchildren without further ado please welcome the couple behind it all where we're going to learn couples therapy in seven words yes you heard me seven words welcome bruce and judy thank you so much thank you. genesis nice to be here with you the pleasure is mine and i can't wait to dive into these seven words because i'm like oh yes seven easy um well, at least I say it. Let me not make any assumptions because it may be work. <laughs> so, <laughs> Bruce and Judy, before we dive into the meat and potatoes of the segment, I want the audience to get to know you a little bit better on the personal front. So I'm going to give you two options. We can do a break the ice up front or a rapid 10 fire question. It may be harder with two, though. <laughs> Mm, I was going to say yeah. that could take a while if we do 10 Yeah, maybe questions. the break the ice up front with that sound. How about a break yeah. the ice? We, we've seen some of your segments, but I'm not quite sure what we're in for, but we have seen some <laughs> of your segments. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so we're breaking the ice with Bruce and Judy. So I want you each to share something crazy that you have done in your life or a fun and interesting fact about yourself. So I'm gonna do ladies first. So Judy, you have the floor. 
Okay, well, I guess I probably am the crazier of the two. So <laughs> I, when I was in college, I joined my college skydiving team. So uh, I, I jumped out of an airplane. <laughs> okay, that is that is crazy, but I'm I'm a little on that crazy bandwagon too. I haven't jumped out of an airplane, but I have done indoor um, skydiving, and eventually I'll do the big thing once I can work up my courage. <laughs> now, Bruce, over to you. Do you want to do something crazy, or you want to share something fun and interesting? Oh my, uh, I I'm I'm searching my brain for crazy. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm really boring. That's I'm. Crazy. <laughs> I'm not I'm not exactly the wild and crazy type, you know, um, certainly. So you can do fun and interesting. I can do fun and interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I could just talk about uh, writing music because uh, that's those are moments when I really go into places that I don't usually go to. Uh, and uh, most of my music, it's in the Jewish world. It's in sort of I've written a lot of liturgical stuff. I wrote a cantata uh, that was based on a lot of different Jewish texts and sort of imaginatively interpreted a lot of different things and and that I was going places in myself that I didn't know were there and, and stylistically it was all different genres of music too yeah it lots was... of different styles that's actually kind of how we met indirectly uh, was that Judy went to a performance of that cantata before I knew him before she even I knew me didn't even know who he was and when we first you know encountered each other and uh, she said oh she had been there and she loved the music and that was it she had me then so. <laughs> Super cool. And I love to hear those stories of how couples um, have met. So I got a bonus in that one. So let's um, dive into couples therapy, the seven words, which I know couples therapy is also the name of your podcast. But how did you guys niche it down to just seven words? Well, I can tell, should I tell the, the origin story? There yes, there's an origin story here. So, and we'll, we'll show you this. Uh, don't hold I'm up not, the cup yet. No, I'm not holding <laughs> we it. have I'm it on a cup. I'm going to take a sip, but I <laughs> yeah. better not. <laughs> but better not, or take it from the other side. Okay. Um, yeah, the, uh, the origin story is when I was early in my practice. Um, so we're talking, I've been in, the private practice been open 27 years. I was doing internships before that. And early on, I was in a, um, in a consultation group with some colleagues. And on the way out the door, one of my colleagues, because we've been talking about couples therapy, on the way out the door, one of my colleagues just turned to me and said, how do you do couples therapy anyway? Which is sort of a ridiculous question to ask, you know, on the way out the door. But I stopped and, th I stopped and thought about it and I said, well, I hadn't thought about it, but if I really boil it all down, I suppose what I'm telling people is be kind and don't panic. Now that's five words if you count and, so that's only five. Be kind and don't panic. And what I mean by be kind, it's not just be nice. Of course, we should all be nice to each other. But be kind in the sense of be kin, you know, recognize your kinship with someone, especially if you're an intimate couple with each other, recognize that you're, you're, in, you're on the same team, you know, even if you're annoyed, you're on the same team, that sense of being kind in that sense. Well, you can't do that if you're in a panic. When people are in a panic, it's just all about fight, flight, freeze, you know, survival. And so the don't panic part, you know, when I stopped and thought about all the training I'd had with working with folks, a lot of it, if you really look at it, it's about saying, how can you not panic? So there was my five word formula, be kind and don't panic. And then, of course, the question then arises, do you, do you know the question? What's how do the question? you not panic? How do you not panic? <laughs> exactly. It's like easy for me to say, don't panic, right? The answer to panic, it seems to me, is two more words, have faith. So the seven words are be kind, don't panic, and have faith. We have that on on. We have props. <laughs> we have merch to say that. Oh, merch. nice. I like that. Yes. Be kind, don't panic in FA. There's our, our uh, podcast logo. logo. And then there's the, the inspiring words. Formula. So when I talk about faith, I don't necessarily mean any particular religious faith. I mean faith in a much more general sense. The way I define faith is when you accept that reality is right to be what it is. So for people who are religious, that's like saying, oh, you mean God is good. But for people who aren't religious, they can still relate to that. It's like an orientation to the world that says, even when things are difficult, even when your partner is annoying the living heck out of you, even when, yeah, and I don't mean to be trivializing it either, even when it's really painful, you know, some really hard stuff is happening. You can still say, yeah, but the world is founded on, it's basically right to be what it is. We have to work with it rather than fight with it. And so that's what lets you not panic and work with it and therefore be kind. So there's, there's my origin story of the seven words. 
I like the origin story of the seven words. And now that you explained it, it is very simple because we all ex exuberate kindness. And I tell people, if you're kinder to the people at work than you are to the people in your home, there's obviously a disconnect there because, you know, you see those people for eight hours a day, but you live with the people inside of your home. And then whenever you talked about the don't panic, when you think about whenever we're panic, our emotions are heightened. And sometimes we have those faux pas and those word vomits. And once you release words out of your mouth, you can't take those words back and how that an other individual is going to feel and perceive what you just said can be very hurtful. So it's like, metaphorically, you're cutting them. And that cut could be, you know, a small um, incision, or it could be a deep laceration. And how do you repair from that? And then the have faith. I come from a religious and spiritual background. Um, and I always like to say, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountain. And anyone who knows how small a mustard seed is, that's very tiny. But imagine something so small as a mustard seed moving a mountain. So imagine what happens when you increase your, your faith. And you have to remember like why you fell in love with that individual. It's not always going to be rosies and, you know, pocket full of dozies or whatnot. But you have to remember, okay, when I stood at that aisle and in front of wherever you got married and I profess, profess my love for this man or this woman, this is how I felt in that moment and think about that and continue to date. Like, cause sometimes I tell my husband like, hey, dude, you haven't taken me on a date in a while. I would love to go to the movies or just, you know, even do something here at the house, but just spending that intimate time with each other. And it doesn't have to be something lavish. It could be something just small and simple, but you're spending time with one another. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you were talking about words can lacerate. And in fact, I think our the last podcast that we did, um, one of our uh, listener questions was, you know, somebody, her she wrote in her husband had said uh, something really mean and cruel. And she said, is that how what he really thinks about me? And like you said, words can have that power to wound so deeply you know it's it's hard it's hard when your partner comes out with something and you're thinking wow is that what he really thinks you know does he really think that i'm i'm what was it a controlling person or yeah whatever yeah it was? yeah and of course what we were talking about was that is what he really thinks when he said it but he also thinks other things are the opposite of that in other words we're always thinking we've got a lot of different things going on in our heads at, at various times but those, yeah, the effect, I just was talking with a couple the other day where uh, the woman was talking about the effect of something her father had said to her when she was 10. And this is a woman in her forties and she's still hurt by this offhand comment her father said to her when she was 10. And you know, the, I've, somebody once said the half-life of a negative comment is 50 years, mm. you know, it's like, it can really last. So, yeah. you know, that, that silly thing that often people would say when I was a kid, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Yeah. Baloney. Uh, <laughs> words can hurt really badly. Yes, we need to be can. careful. With they them. can wound deeply. Yeah. Absolutely. And this qu a question is going to um, be for Judy. So Judy, based on the state stent of y'all's marriage and how long have you been, how long you've been married, what is one challenge that you all face early on and how has it helped you personally and as a couple developed and grow a fonder love for one another? Great question. <laughs> that is a great question. Um, boy, that's tough because we connected so deeply when we first met. I mean, after our first encounter, I, I don't even, our date, you know, yeah. it was, it was like uh, through like J date and, you know, it was like, and I said, let's just meet and have coffee. Cause I just wanted to get it over with. Cause I had been um, divorced at that point, I think five years or something like that. And, and, and I'd been separated for about 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know against I, all of my advice by the way just saying <laughs> i had been through the routine through lunches and dinners and, and drinks and it's like you know the part was like please don't order dessert please don't order dessert that type of thing so when i met bruce and we i said let's just meet for coffee and it was like a two and a half hour coffee and we just we clicked and i said to my girlfriends that night at my mahjong game i play mahjong she said i finally met somebody i think i can have a really deep relationship with and i think after our second or third date 
I mean, I knew I was going to marry him. So I, I think my biggest things were um, any obstacles to overcome, um, just some some baggage that I had from my first marriage that uh, you know you don't, you don't want to repeat. You don't want to make a mistake the second time around, and he's nothing like my first husband. <laughs> but I just wanted to make sure that uh, you know he was okay with things that I had in my past that um, that you know, mm. we all have things in our past that we're not too proud of. Uh, but he was so accepting and non-judgmental about everything that it immediately put me at ease, and I just knew he was he was the guy that just solidified for me. Uh, I can make my life with this man. And it's just been getting better and better every day. So. We're, we're coming up on our 18th anniversary. Wow. Mm -hmm. And yeah. congratulations. Yeah. And I'm going to highlight baggage because I think that's an important part because people fail to realize baggage in relationships. Like the past relationship is just that it's the past, but until you take that baggage out and you heal from it and i'm gonna also interject an analogy here when we travel and we're getting ready to go on that amazing vacation before we even get to our gates they make us go through um baggage where we're getting ticketing and baggage and they ask you to put your luggage on the scale to weigh it why do they do that because they know the aircraft is um, carrying a certain amount of passengers and then the cargo is supposed to be at a certain amount of weight in order for the plane to reach its highest altitude and get there safely to your final destination. So if your baggage is overweight, they're going to ask you to either take out some of the articles from your baggage or to pay for another baggage just so they're um, looking out for the safety of everyone else, not just you. So just like that analogy, sometimes we have to take out some of the unwanted baggage that is hindering us and holding us down in order for us to really be free and see the goodness in somebody else because you don't want that person to bring baggage into the relationship because then baggage plus baggage is a whole lot of baggage and we're not going to be able to go anywhere because we'll be there for a long time taking out those unwanted items so what do you have in your life that's no longer serving you it's not adding value and you're not adding value to it so discard that because when you come into a new relationship it's new for a reason so you need to come in with an open mind and wipe the slate clean and um being with my husband has taught me that we dated for three years i tell people we did it wrong uh, we dated for three years, lived together for one and a half, and I said I test drive, I test drove the car for a long time before I bought it. Um, and I had to realize that coming out of a relationship of narcissistic abuse and just different stuff, I like in the beginning I was putting some of those tendencies onto my husband, realizing that not realizing that he's his own person. And I think that can easily sour a relationship because then you're not giving that that person a fair chance and vice versa. My husband had been married before, um, did not work out. And then he's getting with me and I'm very, you know, direct and I could be very bossy at times because I come from oil and gas. So worked in a male dominated field for 12 years. So I okay. like what I like and I, I want what I want when I want it. And I don't have time for the nonsense. So I think that's important to just keep that in mind. So I'm going to do this question for you, Bruce. From a male perspective, whenever you met Judy, was there any form of baggage, um, whether it was mentally, physically, emotionally, or spiritually, that you needed to let go so you could really embrace the woman that Judy is? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's, I mentioned when we were talking about how we met, and I had been, you know, separated for you know, not, not literally 10 minutes, but very short time. <laughs> and it seemed that way. Yeah. It was literally really about three weeks that my, my ex had moved out. I'm not going to get into the details of it, except I don't think I need to say anything specifically. My, my ex is a fine person, but whatever. It was really clear we were not going to get back together. Let's just put it that way, um, based on who she figured out she was. And so based on that, I knew, I, you know, the reason why it's a bad idea, you know, rebound relationships get a bad rap for a good reason. Because it's exactly, I think, Genesis, what you were saying, that um, you still have too much baggage from the previous one. And so, you know, for me to 
actually take in this actual person sitting next to me, you know, as I was getting to know her, I had to be done with the previous relationship enough. And I know the first day we met, I've, I've told, we've talked about this, mm -hmm. the first day we met, you know, uh, and had that coffee and I, you know, and at the end of it saying, do you want to meet again? And we we're both thinking, yeah. And I wasn't so much, I wasn't ready to be smitten yet. That didn't take very long, but I wasn't ready for that yet. I, I just knew it was uncanny how well suited we are to each other. And so I, that was an amazing experience because, you know, I was still grieving the loss. Of, it was a 30 year marriage. My first one, I got married very young. I got married when I was 20. So that I was, I was still feeling, I mean, it was clear it was over, but I was still feeling that that was painfully gone. And I went home and I just cried out of some combination of grief and release and, and also relief that, oh, there is someone out there that I can really connect with. So I had to, I had to get through that in order to open my heart to fall in love again. It didn't take very long, I have to say, <laughs> but, but that's what I had to do. And I, you know, I recognize that. And, you know, it's funny, I, I think I said, against all advice I've ever given to anybody about, you know, if you just got separated for crying out loud, don't be dating yet. And nevertheless, you know, I just took a peek at, you know, J date. I don't know if you're familiar with that it's a, uh, it's a Jewish. And this was, this was like 19 years ago. Now we're mm -hmm. talking almost 20 years ago, but it, it's a, it's like um, match for, for Jewish people. And so, I, and, and Vermont is a very small Jewish community. And so I just wanted to see, is there anybody on there that I don't already know and realize is probably not right for me. I was living in an even smaller town than Burlington. Burlington, in most of the country would call Burlington a small town. Montpelier is the capital of Vermont, it's where I was living. It, it is the smallest state capital in the country. The population is about 8,500. And so the Jewish community there is tiny. I knew everybody. I mean, with all due respect to all the available women there, they, none of them were right for me. And so I said, well, I'll check out the big city, you know, Burlington. <laughs> and um, so, you know, I went ahead and did that, but I wasn't thinking I would date yet. I was just thinking, I just want to look and see. And then there was this amazing profile that Judy had put up where she said, I'll tell you what she said. She said, an Eshet Chayil, but a woman of today. Now, what's an Eshet Chayil? If you don't know Hebrew, you wouldn't know what that is. Well, an Eshet Chayil, it's a quote from Proverbs, the, the section on a woman of valor. That's what Eshet Chayil means. A woman of valor who can, you know, who can find her price is far above rubies. So she, she worded that directed toward the only man in Vermont who would be perfect for her because... That, that's where my advertising copywriting background came in. <laughs> yeah, because... I knew what an Eshet Chayil was, so I qualified as, oh, Jewish guy who knows something, you know, because she, Judy, Judy knows a lot. She's got a, yeah, that's check. And she said, a woman of today, because if she had just said an Eshet Chayil, I would think the, the Yiddish expression would be too from. Uh, in other words, too religiously observant for me, because I am somewhat, but not that much. You know, I'm not like Orthodox in my practice. I was at one time, but not so much anymore. So she, it was perfect. It's like, I'm the guy. And so, anyway, that's that's a long, a long answer I, I to your question. I wrote it to get him. <laughs> yeah, she, she didn't know it, but she wrote it to get me, and it worked. <laughs> that's amazing. And now here's another question for both of you. So think about couples therapy as a whole, and pair it with the seven, um, the seven words that you all stand on, and think about love languages. How can partners understand each other's love language so they know what their partner wants and what their partner needs so they can effectively communicate and bridge the gap. Mm, yeah. I'll let wanna, you take that I'll one. Take that. Yeah, okay, sure. I'll, I'll yeah, I, to the therapist. <laughs> yeah, I think the way that maps on to uh, the seven words actually is pretty direct because, you know, you know, it, it's funny, there's the golden rule and then there's the platinum rule. This it was somebody we interviewed actually mentioned that that term to it. The golden rule, of course, we all know, right? Do unto others as you would, as they would do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That turns out to be a bad idea. That's contrary to the notion of love languages, because I should do unto you according to your love languages, not mine. Mm -hmm. So the platinum rule is no, do unto others as they would have you do unto them. You know, it's like, so I, the things that may be my love languages may not be yours mm -hmm. and I should attend to yours. Now, the way that that maps onto the seven words is if I'm in a panic, I can't possibly tell what that is. If I'm feeling like, oh no, all the stuff I think should work isn't working with her and I'm panicking about it. I'm utterly missing the fact that if I can calm down 
and say, no, wait a minute, she's got different buttons to press that'll work for her. That, you know, it's, it's a, to be, sometimes it's a silly analogy, but I sometimes say, you know, when you marry someone, you, you do need to get a copy of their user's guide, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a, there's a gender piece to this, especially true for men. We, we can't seem to find the user's guide for women, you know? It's because men don't use the user's guide. They just think, oh, you know, I'll we do just it. Wing I, it. We know how right. to do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> turns and out they don't. It turns out we don't, and we, we do know how to read the user's guide. And if you're in a panic, you can't do that. So have faith so you cannot be in a panic, so you can actually attend to what this person who is your kin really wants in terms of their love language. So that's that's a way of kind of resolving those two, I think. So Judy, do you want to add anything on to that regarding love languages? I think I just want to append to that is that always keep in mind that your partner, um, and hopefully you feel this way, and that's why I'm like, go back to my first marriage, that's why things didn't work out, I think, is that I know that whatever I do or say, whether or not Bruce agrees or disagrees with me, he always, I know he always has my best interests at heart. So, you know, I, I feel it with everything he says and does to me and for me. So I, I'm not inhibited about saying anything or doing anything with him because I know that he, he's always thinking of me and putting me first. Well, and can I add to that? I mean, mm -hmm. I think a, a, crucial, a critical part of that, especially for men to know even more than women, is when you're saying that, I'm, I'm touched to hear that. I'm glad you feel that way. I want you to feel that way. One of the reasons I think you can feel that way is that I'm not, I can be an arrogant person. I'm capable of that, but I'm not so arrogant as to think that I know better than you what's in your best interest. Mm -hmm. So in knowing, in, in wanting your best interest, yeah. I have to be listening to you, what you really want, as opposed to what I think you're supposed to want. No, yeah, and, and, and that's, that's what I'm difference. saying, yeah. you know, it's the non-judgmental part yeah. of you. But even if, and it, you're hardly ever critical of anything, you have such a nice way of saying it, and of saying things to me that I know that he's putting me first. Hmm. He always puts me first. Yeah, it, it, that's and, and and even little things like we we go out walking together every day, and he'll make an effort to walk on the outside so that you know he's if the, the car's gonna go off the road, it's gonna hit him first. I mean, you know, it, it, it's like a teeny tiny thing, but I know you know no, no matter where we're walking, he'll always put himself in harm's way before he will let me get there. So just little things, you know. And thank you for sharing that and the way that you all just communicated there for those watching the video you could see how they both stopped and paused and actively listening is the key to make sure that you heard what the other person said you processed it and then you are speaking versus interrupting and interjecting where that person feels like they're not heard and it shuts them down and then um the last question before we jump into the call to action is you all focus on the needs for stability and intimacy and how they require different skills because being like for men because men are like waffles they like to compartmentalize women are like noodles they're very um flexible and they get interweave themselves and that's not a genesis quote i heard that from like a marriage seminar and so right. i gotta quote you on that <laughs> thank you for giving credit where it's due but i i, I gotta quote you on that <laughs> and so one thing um is sometimes men feel like, oh, I'm providing for you. Like I, like I'm making sure, you know, the house is taken care of. I pay the bills and all of this stuff. And they think that's stability, but maybe your partner wants another form of stable of stability. But if you don't ask, then you just think what you're doing is providing their that stability. And then whenever you think about intimacy, there's various forms of intimacy. It's not just the sexual intimacy, they may want intellectual intimacy, they may want physical intimacy, just giving them a hug, a kiss, just showing that gratitude, that appreciation, or etc and i feel like sometimes in this day and age you know sex money drugs and violence sells on tv and television is telling you a vision and people just see intimacy as one-sided but it is multifaceted. so can you all interject here before we jump into the call to action yeah sure can i go with that yeah yeah i mean intimacy uh, when I, I talk about them both as needs that uh you know if if we lack 
stability is pretty, I think most people think of it more or less the same way. Stability means you're not really worried about the relationship. If it feels stable, you know, you wake up in the morning and you're not thinking, oh, what's going to happen to my relationship today? Stability is important. It's every bit as important as intimacy. But what a lot of couples will do, because stability gets to be like super important, you, you do things like you marry someone, you have kids, you, you know, keep upping the ante, so to speak. Stability becomes very important. You can start to panic if it feels like, oh, no, that's threatened. So people will avoid rocking the boat sometimes. And intimacy, of course, is about things like physical, physical, sexual, spiritual, intellectual intimacy. Those are all important. Sometimes intimacy involves telling your partner something you're pretty sure they're not going to enjoy hearing. You know, I wish you would do X, Y, or Z, or I wish you wouldn't do X, Y, or Z. Or I, I've had a dream that I want to do something that we're not doing, and I'm not sure if you're going to be okay with that, you know? To raise anxiety, and that's what I, my, I preach about. It's, it does sound mm -hmm. like preaching, doesn't it? I preach about um, the chief skill of intimacy is to tolerate anxiety as opposed to avoiding it. You have to be able to not you raise anxiety, not because you're being a jerk, but because you need to, you know, if I need to say something new, you need to say something to me and you're worried about, you know, how we might react. That is a, a really important intimacy skill. And, and my favorite met, uh, metaphor for stability and intimacy, it's like a plant. Stability is the roots that hold it in place so it doesn't just blow over in the breezes. But intimacy is the energy for growth. And, you know, you talked earlier, Genesis, about a mustard seed moving mountains. Another uh, way analogy is think about a if they're paving over a sidewalk and there's a seed under there and that seed is germinated, it's going to try and crack the sidewalk or die trying. We do not tolerate if our intimacy is is cut off. And so one way or another, somebody's going to crack the sidewalk. And sometimes that comes out as an affair or as uh, somebody just all of a sudden, you know, uh, abruptly departing the relationship without any warning or fighting about everything and anything except what's really bothering them. Uh, there's all kinds of sort of symptoms of lack of intimacy, but that's a lot of what I deal with with folks. Because right, they don't want to rock the boat. Because they don't want to rock so, the boat, which is understandable. Yeah, you you know? just keep keep holding it in until it explodes. Yeah. Yeah. And Judy, would you like to add anything there before we jump into the call to action as it's coming close to the time commitment? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I just did. So okay. <laughs> awesome. that was my two cents. I think we can go on to the call to action. Yeah. So Bruce and Judy or Judy and Bruce, what is your call to action for this segment? What do you want the listeners to gravitate to? Oh, gee. Well, I mean, there's what what do you think? Well, there's our seven word formula. Uh, that's, but... that's what popped in my mind. <laughs> Be kind, don't panic and have faith is one way of. of well, I think, yeah. you know, just building on what you what we just talked about, the stability and intimacy and how important both are for a relationship because you can't really be intimate unless you feel stable with your partner and, and you know conversely you can't really uh feel stable if you don't have the intimacy and you know both both are so critical to have a strong caring loving and growing relationship you know if our relationship um, was just stable and we weren't growing, I don't think we would be as happy as we are now. I think we're probably happier, uh, if that's possible, and more in love today than we were, you know, 18 years ago when we got married. Um, it's just gotten better because I think both of us have been able to maintain that level of both stability and intimacy. Amazing. And now, say it better. <laughs> uh, uh, Bruce, I want you to hold up that book. And yes, that's I was just thinking. <laughs> so reigniting the spark, y'all, and your book is available on Amazon, right? On Amazon and anywhere books are sold. And also the what's proven uh, quite popular is the audio version, which I did the narration for. Mm -hmm. So if you want to hear my dulcet tones uh, narrating the book, uh, you can get the audio version from the Amazon site as well. And also Kindle. Yeah, we'll and also there's the Kindle, Kindle version as well. Right. Yeah. Amazing. I'll have that in the show notes. And Bruce and Judy, tell the audience how they could connect with you, plug your website, and where you primarily hang out on social media. So okay, go, our go website is CT, like couples therapy, CT in seven and the number seven dot com. And you can write to each of us like Bruce at CT in seven dot com or Judy at CT in seven dot com. 
Uh, social media, I think we're mostly on Facebook and uh, some Instagram these mm -hmm. days, not too much. We're, we're, we, we made all of we're, one we're TikTok video. Social, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, on, on we're Facebook. We're not huge social media people. Um. Yeah, the Facebook page is Couples Therapy in Seven Words. I think you it's have a Pinterest out. account, but that's kind of hmm, Yeah, I'm not, not using that a lot. <laughs> no, the, if, uh, the social media place, especially where, I don't want to say you're an old fogey, but I am. Uh, for, for those of us who are old fogies, it's Facebook, right? More than okay. more than we're actually you young folks saying out but um it's uh, couples therapy in seven words is the name of our facebook page we post like our podcast we announce them on there and uh, occasionally put other postings up there as well amazing so there you have it audience we just had bruce chalmer and judy alexander all of their contact information will be in the show notes make sure you like comment and subscribe we're on 40 plus platforms and to see the video to this recording head on over to Genesis no, gems with genesis and mars camp on youtube and you'll find all things video content and until next time peace love and lots of blessings. Have yourself an amazing day. And I challenge you to be kind and don't panic. Plus, have faith from Bruce and Judy. Well, we hope you enjoyed that. And uh, we hope that you tune into other um, interviews that Genesis does with her Gems podcast. And uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we have always pointed out we would like you to let folks know about this podcast do that by all the stuff you do liking our social media posts and following subscribing and telling your friends all of the above and uh indeed if you would like to suggest a topic for us or if you'd like to suggest yourself as a, a guest to be at our program you can Tell folks, Judy, tell folks how they can write to us. <laughs> you can go to our website, ctn7.com, or you can write to either of us individually, Bruce at ctn7.com or Judy at ctn7.com. At ctn7.com, you'll see it right up above our heads when if we If you're watching, this. and mm -hmm. if and if you're listening, it's the number seven, not the word written out. So CT, like couples therapy, in number seven.com. So that uh, we've got some uh, other guests coming up that we've mm -hmm. already lined up and um, some really exciting topics coming up. So we'll look forward to doing that in future episodes. And I think we've covered what we need to cover. Have I we think not? we have. And so until next time. Remember, be kind. Don't panic. And have faith. Mm -hmm.